Well, hello again, my friends. As we go into the investment stage, I thought I'd put a video together in stocks. So we're going to look at investing in stocks. So why would a corporation issue stock and the main stock that they issue is common stock? Well, if you've had a, another business course before this, this is what we call equity financing. So we are trying to finance a business. It could be a large company like Apple, Microsoft, General Motors. It could be a brand new startup that's trying to expand and they're doing that via equity financing, which would be in the stock market. So this is equity. Um, we're not borrowing the money if for the corporation. Each stockholder becomes an owner of the corporation, a percentage owner. So it may be very small. Um, if you buy a lot of stock, it, it could be sizable. The, f the benefits of equity financing for a corporation is they don't have to repay that money back. If they were to borrow the money from a bank or issue bonds, well, those are debts and they have to be paid back. Um, so the company does not have to buy back shares from stockholders. If they choose to, they could, but they do not have to. And as a stockholder, if you don't like the company's performance, you can sell that back and you'll sell that back into the open market um, via uh, a broker or, or some agent who's going to help you do that. So there we are. It is the main way in the United States economy that large corporations expand and gain their capitalization is through stock offerings. And again, they have many Corporations have millions of shares of stock in the market at any given time. So that's common stock. Common stock is the main stock of the United States for an organization. Common stockholders get to vote. So if you ever buy common stock for an organization, at least once a year, there's a board of directors meeting and they vote on company policy, board of directors, elect CEO, etc., etc. Now, that's great. So how can you make money by buying common stock? Well, since you're an owner, and if our company does very well, they pay their owners in the form of a dividend. So that's the stock dividend. And this may be once a year, twice a year, possibly even four times a year. That would be per each quarter. And the dividend could be in cash uh, or additional stock. So you could get a cash dividend if you own a thousand shares of stock and they pay one dollar per share uh, dividend, then you get a thousand dollars during that uh, that payout period. You could also elect for that instead of taking cash that I want that stock to purchase more stock and that helps you grow. So instead of cash, you'll get additional shares of stock. Uh, sometimes if the company is not is brand new and they're not doing they don't really have the money, they're trying to reinvest everything uh, for growth then they may give you some company products. That's a rarity, but it is a possibility. So, common stock, we buy Apple, all right? We buy Berkshire Hathaway, Microsoft. Well, you could buy a very small stock as well. Um, we look at dollar appreciation. That is, hopefully it goes up. Let's say you buy it for $50 a share and it goes to $100 a share. Now you multiply that stock price by the number of shares you own and that gives you your valuation for your investment. So, other things that can happen in the stock market or the stock that you own, it's very possible that a company will split its stock. Uh, we'll take Apple for, ex for example. Apple likes to keep their stock price somewhere around $100. They don't like it going over uh, $200 per share. And so they will split that and they split it every few years because it's a very popular company. People believe the value is so great. Um, again, that value may be perceived, but, but they like to buy a lot of it. And so if a stock splits, you get extra stock and the price will come down. So if it's $200 a share and a company wants to keep it at $100 a share, then it's a two for one split. So for every stock you own, you get an additional share but the price comes down to $200, and then, excuse me, to $100, and then it may go up again. It's kind of exciting if you own stock and you've had stock splits. It's a, it's a nice way to grow the number of shares, and then, of course, you hope that stock price continues to rise in the future. 
There's another stock that companies could issue is called preferred stock. Now preferred stock is much more of the company's way to do special financing. We call it preferred because it sits above the common stock. If a company were to declare a dividend, they would pay the preferred stockholders first and generally speaking that preferred stock is going to get a better rate of return. So if that's the case then why don't we all have preferred stock? Well there's some different reasons for that. Uh, preferred stock also has a higher in the chain. Um, if a company goes bankrupt, an organization, a corporation, they have to pay back their bank loans first, then their series of bondholders if they've issued bonds, so any debt they have to pay that back first. Now, of course, that's before the CEOs and the board of directors have taken a few million dollars each for themselves. And now we go down to preferred stock, and then the very last people to ever get any money from a bankrupted company would be common stock. And that's usually never going to happen. And all that, that, that money is gone. But, but that's the list. And of course, as you purchase preferred stock, it is already at a set price. It's, it's, it's really, um, I mean, the market could affect that, but you know the dividend that you're going to get. The one thing about preferred stock is it does not vote. So you don't vote in. The common stock holders vote the CEO. Well, they vote the board of directors who then vote. So the common stock is powerful in the terms of who gets to control the company. Uh, preferred stock is when we want to finance something, uh, uh, an internal project, or we need some money. We don't really want to go into the uh, uh, the debt sector, uh, so we will ask some very you know ex wealthy investors. Warren Buffett did this during the recession of 2007, 2011. Uh, I believe it was either General Electric or Chrysler that he basically purchased seven. A billion dollars worth of preferred stock he got a guaranteed rate of return of seven percent for four years and he could roll that back over it's good to be the king it's good to have that type of money we're in the stock market so this is not a bank okay we know that this is not a money market account this is not where we're putting our emergency fund there's really no guarantee of wealth you you're hoping that the company is going to do very well this is risk and return so we are now in the higher risk so if we're at a high risk, we should hope that reward is going to be higher. We're going to have to do probably, not probably, but, but very much so, a lot more research in here. So if we're looking at stock classifications, there's blue chip. Companies have been around a long time. Uh, there's large cap. Those are companies that are capitalized probably over $20 billion worth of assets. Mid cap, small cap, micro cap, very, very brand new companies coming out. There's also penny stocks that are stocks on different markets uh, that actually trade for under a dollar. And there's cyclical, defense, growth, income. I mean, there's all sorts of classifications that you might want to look at. So I think you have to look at your age. You have to look at how much risk am I willing to take. If I'm somebody uh, under 40, Okay, if I'm in my 20s and 30s, and certainly my 20s, I would probably have my risk factor higher, which means I have a lot longer time that uh, to invest, and that stock can go up and down, hopefully go up a lot more than it goes down. So I might be looking at growth stocks and even small capitalizations, companies that have a lot of room for improvement. Again, that's, that's just the tactic we take. If I'm in my 40s and up and I'm nearing retirement, I'm probably looking at blue chip, large cap, and income uh, stocks. That is companies that have been there and have a track record. However, again, there's no guarantee that any company makes it two or three years from now, especially in the technology route that we're in with so much disruption in these last 20 years. Um, every company has to really prove themselves every single day. Well, here's the psychology of stock investing. So, let's just kind of, you know, level the playing field a little bit since the year 1926. All right, that is that is just prior to the Great Depression of the United States. Stock have had somewhere or positive gains somewhere around 70 of those years. And since that same time, we had about 26 poor years. That was negative gains. Uh, and 
2022, we had a very negative stock market. So it happens. But more so than not, basically we've got almost a 3 to 1 ratio that your stocks will appreciate over time versus lose money. Since World War II, and that's what we would say postmodern U.S. history, the stock market has averaged 10% annual returns. Okay, 10% annual return, we're always judging a investment, no matter what it is, if we're, if we're getting paid interest or we are paying interest, by the rule of 72. So 72 divided by 10 is right about 7, which means every 7 years my money would double. And that's, that's a nice rate. So we're in double-digit returns right now. Again, it's more risk, so we should have a higher return. Friends, um, you got to do your diligence. Sometimes we love a company. Uh, I love Apple. I mean, I, I, can, I can remember when Apple first came out, all right, and uh, from the Apple IIc, from the Apple II to the first Macintosh, and I've always been a big fan. We don't want to have emotions control us. Uh, that may or may not be a great company to invest in. We're looking for growth opportunities. We're looking for sales, for profits. I mean, it is a very profitable company, the most profitable company in the United States. Uh, of course, they also have a, a higher stock price. But, but you need to do the diligence of your research, and there's lots of different research out there. I believe I have those on those market research. Just market watch itself. The website is a great place to learn. Um, again, the key to wisdom is to understand what we do not already know. Socrates would say that. So, you know, again, look at the company's product line, what's being created. Do you think this is a company that's, that's going to grow? Hey, Kodak, Blockbuster, Sears, Disruption. Those three entities right there owned their industry. Kodak owned the film developing and the film market of cameras for over a hundred years. Blockbuster. Oh, if you can remember the 90s, if you can remember even the 80s when Blockbuster was formed. Blockbuster was formed by David Cook in Dallas, Texas. Then it was bought by Wayne Huizinga, who owned the Miami Dolphins in the late 80s, early 90s. It's been bought and sold several times and now it's not even in existence. But man, they owned it. They, uh, there was a Blockbuster oh, almost in every neighborhood. And when's the last time you thought about that? Sears. Sears was the Amazon of the day, with the Sears and Roebuck catalog. Uh, they were the largest company at one point in the 80s and 70s and 80s. Largest retailer. They own banks. They own real estate firms. And all three companies are, are, are DOA. You know, they're, they're all gone. I think, I think Kodak is somewhat back in existence, but, but nothing what they were doing in the consumer level, more of an industrial level product. Disruption came, and they just sat there and watched it. 1974, Kodak invented the digital camera and got scared, put it on the back burner. Other companies, Nikon, Sony, Canon, raced to it in the 90s, late 90s and early aughts. And, well, you know the rest of history. So, there is a lot of investors who held on to that stock because they thought the companies were so great. Come on, it can't be happening. They're not never going to lose. Well, they lost everything. They lost everything. So, again, the more research you do, we don't get too emotional on that. When it's time to sell, it's time to sell. There we are. Economic environment, business cycles, inflation rates. Again, we don't want to overreact either way. Uh, either buying too early, all right, or selling too late. Okay, uh, we need to just uh, whatever stocks you have, you're going to want to know what that company is always in. If you're purchasing single stocks, and that's what we're talking about. One more time, how do I get my money? Income from dividends. Again, we pay that profit to the stockholders because if you go buy a few shares of Tesla, great Amazon, Apple, Walmart, American Express, Visa, you are part owner of that company. Even if it's a fraction of a percent, you're still an owner. So you get some sort of dividend each year, either stock or growth dividend from the stock itself. Um, usually they're paid quarterly. They could be paid semi-annually. For example, Apple pays 75 cents a share uh, per stock. So if you had two shares, hey, you got $1.50. Uh, but that's not your game. Your game is hoping that Apple is going to increase the value of that stock, stock appreciation. All right, all right. And there we go. So let's just say you buy the stock, you hold the stock, and then you sell it at a higher price. If your parents were alive, 
or you were live in 1997, and I certainly was. I saw Apple stock right about three dollars a share. Um, Michael Dell of Dell Computer, when he was asked the question, now Steve Jobs is just getting back into Apple. He's rebranding or reconfiguring the company. He's fired everyone who fired him back in the 80s. It's an interesting story. It's at 356 a share. Michael Dell said, "What should we do with Apple?" When he was asked that question, he said, "Hey, leave them for dead. They're they're a non-existent company." Interesting. Well, if you purchased a thousand dollars worth of Apple stock, just a thousand dollars worth, so you did a thousand shares, that'd be three thousand five hundred sixty dollars. You bought a, a thousand shares, it'd be a uh, thousand dollars worth would have gotten you somewhere around uh, three hundred shares. Just a thousand dollars in twenty twenty, you'd have six hundred and thirty two if you just bought it and held on to it. Uh, that's a nice appreciation. Oh, if we could only invent a time machine and go back and buy a, a million shares. Uh, well, can't do that. Can't do that. All right. I talked about a stock split. So you might see this. If you're holding on to that stock, and that is exactly what happened to Apple during those 20, uh, 30 years, it split many different times. And so you had a lot. So you had 1,000 shares. You probably end up having closer to to about 10,000 shares. And that's what, what blew it up so much. Sometimes the stock price, it, 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 it rises out of the ideal range. So the corporation says, man, we, we would attract more investors if we got that price back to where we wanted it to be. And again, we're going to say $100 for Apple. So in 2020, August, um, Apple had their one, one of their big splits. It was 400 a share, and they thought, you know what, we need to get, we want more financing for our operations. So they split it. So for every share that you had, you got four shares for that stock. Now, the value on that date remained the same. So you had 400 shares. 400 times 400 is 160,000. All right, you split. Now you own 1,600 shares, but it's a hundred dollars. Per share, it's back to 160,000. Of course, that stock has gone up, and I believe they split it one more time in these last few years. Um, they'll split it throughout the. Uh, they'll do it again and again. Uh, so that's a nice way to get stock accumulation, provided you haven't sold it. Information sources: MSN Money is great. Yahoo Finance. I mean, you. Uh, Always look for what is free. If I haven't said that in prior videos, I, I apologize. But one of the rules in personal finance and business alone, what's out there that's free? I don't really need to talk. I don't need to pay somebody a lot of money right now. I'm in the in the information gathering stage. Yahoo Finance, Market Watch, Motley Fool. There's a lot of different places out there. You go to, uh, You can just go on. Um, just the internet and look at any stock price right in there with stock price of, uh, again, Berkshire Hathaway. And, and then you can find lots of different information sources. And again, uh, I think Market Watch is another great one. So utilize everything that's free information, my friends. Back in the day, back in the day of those 90s and 80s, you did have to go to a broker just to get any type of information. And by the time you left their office, you, you were in a few thousand dollars. Uh, again, that's how they made their money. Someone's they always have to make their money in the business world. We're not. We're trying to survive and do well on our own. Here's some great sources right in there. Bankrate, Investopedia. I think I have that uh, website up for you. Know and Grow, Financial Knowledge, Nerd Wallet. All great stuff. You should be utilizing this. It'd be great in your investment stages, my friends. Corporate earnings play a big part. So how do we know a company is doing well? Um, we could look at corporate earnings, all right? Earnings per share. That makes a lot of sense. Is the company profitable? And then we want to say, how much are they earning per share of stock that they've issued? And again, what's the price earnings ratio? I mean, we can get into all sorts of numbers to say, hey, is this company a good deal? Are they undervalued or are they overvalued? So let's take a look at that. So when we look at stock, here's just a quick graph of Apple stock in the first decade of the new millennium. Uh, again, very low price coming out of the low 90s. Uh, different times it started splitting stock. And that was at 2011. It was at 400. Uh, went up to $700 per share, I think, right about 2012. Uh, even through a very hard recession. So that's what makes Apple stock 
people really, really like that. So if we're looking at earnings per share, we do earnings per share is simply the after-tax net income of an organization divided by all the outstanding shares of stock. So if we just take Apple 2021, uh, their after-tax income was $56 billion. So all salaries paid, everything paid out, uh, net income after taxes, $56 bill. At 17 billion shares, that would give us a $3.30 per share. That's a healthy sign if the number is positive. We certainly like that. Well, now we want to do a price earning ratio. We just want to go down one more layer and see, you know, again, what's the value of this company and uh, should I buy or not? Again, these are very personal decisions. I just love the company Apple and I want a piece of that stock. So we look at this. We look at the stock price. So this was done in 2023. $182 closed out the stock price and their earnings per share was $6.13. So they had a pretty nice increase in a couple of years. So the P.E. ratio is 29. What does that even mean? Okay, well there's Tim Cook right there, CEO of Apple. Uh, investors are paying $29 for each dollar that Apple earns. So Apple earns a dollar and you're paying $29 to be a part of that. The industry standards of price earning ratios are somewhere around 10 to 15 dollars. So we would certainly say Apple is a premium company. Uh, investors really like the, the organization, how it's run, the products, and they're willing to pay a pretty good sized premium, almost double what the industry standards are. All right. Well, that's Peter Lynch. You maybe heard of Merrill Lynch brokerage firms. Well, he was a big partner of that, one of the, one of the founding partners. Uh, back in those 70s and 80s and 90s of how we can really churn out what's a what's a good stock to buy take all emotions out we don't care what they're making but we do care that they're making a profit but whatever products they are so he looked at projected earnings so he looked at something called a projected earnings growth ratio or a peg ratio and it's basically your price earning ratio divided by the annual earnings per share growth rate Okay, if you love numbers, this might be real fun for us. Uh, this number helps us determine, in Peter Lynch's opinion, if it's an undervalued company or if it's an overvalued company. So according to Peter Lynch, and he was a, a, a very, very, very good investor, uh, a number less than one should mean this is an undervalued company and there's a lot of growth in there. Take advantage of a stock growth coming up. If he saw something greater than one, he said, well, I think they peaked and they're going to be overvalued. So let's see how we would do that ratio if you just want to really get technical into stocks. Nothing wrong with that. Here's company A. So price per share of stock was $46. Their earnings per share this year was $2.09. If we can figure out, and we can, we'll find the earnings per share the prior year was $1.74. So let's find that peg ratio. Prior, uh, pe you know, price earnings ratio equals 46, that's the price per share, divided by 209. That was EPS this year. That gave us the price earnings of 22. So now we want to see, is that company growing? So we take the price earnings from last year, earnings per share, and the earnings per share from the year before, okay, minus one so we can get a percentage we have a 20 percent growth rate so now we take the price earning ratio and we divide it by the growth rate 22 divided by 20 gives us a 1.1 1 .1. Well, that's a bigger number than that 1.1 according to peter lynch and again my friends it's information do with it what you would like would consider that's a little bit of an overvalued company um company b all right, price per share, $80. Earnings per share this year was $2.67. The previous year was $1.78. So the price earning ratio equals $80, that's the share price, divided by the current earnings per share gives us a 30. So let's see the growth rate that we may have. We're going to divide the uh, this year's earnings per share by the previous earnings per share. And again, we do the minus one so we can just get a percentage right in here, 50%. So now, we have the 30 right there divided by the growth rate of 50.6. 
under one. According to Peter Lynch, that company is undervalued. It's a good time to buy that stock and uh, hopefully it will grow again. Now you may have heard that, that previous earnings and, and what happened in the past may not be a very good indicator of what happens in the future. It's just a way that we say we don't know they're going to keep growing. But given those two scenarios, company B stock may be more pleasing to buy so we can get some extra growth. It's a little undervalued. They're, uh, they're doing very, very well. Lessons to learn. This is what it all comes down to. Find a company that's undervalued with good future growth. You may have the ingredients for a good stock, but you you do have to conduct a lot of research. You would want to know what that company is doing. It gets a, a you know, and certainly certainly a lot more work than just putting money into a certificate of deposit or to a money market account. That gets very you know minimal interest. We want to get into the double digits, and so. This is a great place to learn how to do that, is the stock market. There's the man who's possibly the best investor of all time, Warren Buffett, owner, uh, founder, uh, partner of Berkshire Hathaway. Price is what you pay, value is what you get. So the philosophy is look for the industry standards and look for companies that are undervalued. That's what did make Warren Buffett the, the genius investor that he has. He took a lot of emotion out, and um, one thing that he did that he says he only invested in companies that he really had a thorough knowledge of. He knew industrial companies very well. He's an older guy. He's probably in his 90s now. Um, so old school, so to speak. He didn't. It took a long time for him to get into the technology market, and he just simply said, because I don't know it. I don't know that industry very well, and I'm not comfortable of putting billions of dollars in something I don't know, but I do know different industries and a lot of manufacturing, a lot of different service-based businesses. So... Uh, understand that industry brokerage firms are all over the place when you want to get into this there's Merrill Lynch in the uh, left hand corner Fidelity Investments are right in our neighborhood in Westlake uh, your bank may have that Ameritrade a lot of online Charles Schwab discount brokers what about Robinhood you might like this you know that can be a little intimidating when you're working with a broker even a discount broker and I, I, I get that some of us just don't have time to you know have a meeting and and, and go and, and and talk about all of our financials but Robinhood is a great app I like it and I love Acorns app which we'll talk about more in the mutual fund area the cost is free um, we're buying micro shares of stock or you could so if I wanted to buy some Tesla and I don't have the full two, three hundred dollars per share, I can just put in ten dollars and now I'm buying micro shares of stock. That's what makes Robinhood so interesting. You can buy as much as you want and you can buy as little as you want. I believe they give you uh, anywhere from twenty dollars to thirty dollars of free stock as you as you uh, apply. You connect that to your bank account. And again, it gets you into the game, it gets you into studying stocks, and there's a lot of great research that they will that, that you're going to learn. It's available on obviously iOS, which is Apple and the Droid. So uh, if you are interested in stocks and you want to open up a quick Robinhood account, nothing wrong with that. And it's very low cost because trying to get in, it's it's basically run by a lot of social media, that is, we're getting friends to get in. And uh, it's tracking through AI uh, uh, all different stocks. And so, interesting way to get in, my friends. And believe me, these companies are scared of that. That's a disruptive technology. So they're trying the same thing, trying to get you an app where you can do it all day. You don't have to call anybody up. You can look at your portfolio any given time. And if you said, you know what, I'm going to throw another $100 into this stock or another $10. I believe Robinhood also, as most of the apps do, they work on your roundups. So it's tied to your bank account, like a debit account. And for every debit transaction you make, maybe I'm sure you're familiar with roundups, but if I did a dollar fifty, well, I don't know what you buy for a dollar fifty, let's go seven fifty cup of coffee at Starbucks, it would take it would round up fifty cents to the nearest dollar, which would be to eight. So fifty cents, and then it would put it into whatever stock you have your roundups in. And basically it waits till it gets five or ten dollars and then it invests that. So it's a it's a it's a way you're always accumulating little bits and pieces of money into these uh, apps, and Acorns does a great job of that too. So when you're spending money, you're also investing money. It's an interesting way. A lot of fun. I think you'd like it. Is it a bull? Is it a bear market? Can we make 
money both ways. Can we make money going up? Well, we just talked about that. Buy low, sell high. Well, what happens in a bad year? What happens, that's what we call a bear market. Bears going down. And so we saw that certainly in these first two decades of the, uh, this millennia, we saw hardcore in 2022. Uh, as we go in now to the middle of the 2020s and to the end of it, yeah, there's going to be ups and downs. There's always going to be a, a bear market. Can we make money going down? Uh, losing when a company loses that. Well, yeah, ab absolutely. It's what hedge funds do. Uh, let's look at the stock transactions. If you're going to get more so, if you're going to really start getting hundreds and hundreds of shares of stock, you could put a market order in with your broker. You could probably also do this on a discount broker. And that is, I'm going to buy at this price and it automatically buys or sells at the market value that you pick. And so uh, there's also limits. I buy or stock at, uh, at a specific price or better. So when you believe it's at this price, you have an order to buy 100 shares or 10 shares or whatever that might be. Most brokerage firms want to sell at least um, denominations, so to speak, of at least 100 shares. They don't like selling one or two shares. That's why the Robinhood app is so great because it lets you buy smaller amounts of shares. Now, let's just say, hey, this company looks good, but uh, I don't have time to check my stocks all the time. What if it goes down? If I want to take a motion, even though I love company XYZ, it's starting to lose value on stock and it keeps going down. And we say, you know what? I'm going to hold on. I'm going to hold on because it's a favorite company of mine. That uh, We want to take a motion out because you could lose a lot of money. So we do something called a stop order loss, which means I'm going to request, I bought my stock at $80 and I am willing to go to lose at 68. So if it goes down to 68, then it's a stop loss. Sell it all, and it's automatically done. Sometimes when we see very big swings in the stock market, we certainly saw this in the 1980s, in the 1990s, in the early aughts, um, it's like the perfect storm. So many computers uh, rise trading has programmed in stop loss orders that when the market starts going down, it will start selling it out. And if every computer in the world starts doing it at the same time, trying to sell out stocks, uh, let's just say of Apple, again, uh, that price more than likely, they're not buying it, they're selling it, is going to go down. And it can do a giant trigger effect. And you can see the whole market swing five, six, seven hundred points in one or two days. And it usually happens at the end of the month uh, when people are taking some of their profits out. So the, the, the stocks do tend to lose a little bit of value. And uh, when all this happens, like I say, it could be the perfect storm that everyone's trying to do a stop loss order because they don't want that price of stock going down. It's a way to protect you, my friends. So you can just say, I won't get that emotional. I like this stock. But at this price, if it gets below this, it, it automatically is selling and putting the money back in my account. And I'm going on to my next deal. Now, those are a few things. Now, there's something called short selling. If you've heard of the movie, The Big Short, by Michael Lewis, it's a book he wrote. It's a major motion picture. Um, you'll find it on YouTube. You can find it on at least any of the streaming devices. I would highly suggest you watch it. How do we sell things short? We are betting that the market is going in a different direction. Dr. Michael Burry is one of the big investors, uh, certainly highlighted in this film. A lot of a lot of uh, pretty good actors in the movie itself, but he shorted the real estate market. Uh, if you want to make a financial engineering vehicle, Wall Street's happy to do that. If you want to bet some way, if you want to bet securities going down, if you want to bet homes, real estate, uh, I don't think there's a bet they won't take. Uh, that's just the way it's, 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 it's somewhat of a giant gambling casino if we want to get to the nitty gritty of, of, of Wall Street. Good book. So yes, this is selling short. You can short out a company. So let's say you think a company's not going to do well. You've been reading it uh, up. You think their technology is outdated. Um, they're just going to go down. And you don't want to bet high. You want to bet low. So it's very sophisticated way of doing this, and I do need to say it is the highest risk in the stock market. So you really do need to be uh, an educated investor on this. 
All right, that notwithstanding, here we go. So you believe company ABC is just going to go down. So you go to a broker and you're a short seller. So you actually borrow the stock from a brokerage firm. They'll, they've got stock. They're going to do this for you. And then you say, okay, I'm going to sell my share. So I'm borrowing it, which means it's a loan. I'm going to sell my share right now, uh, 10 shares for $500. So it's $50 a share. You believe that's going to go way below 50. And so now you've sold it. All right. The stock loses value. Great. Cause that's what you wanted to happen. And so now let's just say it's gone down uh, $10. Okay. Just as an easy thing. So it's gone to 40 a share. So now you're buying that share back of 10 stocks. You buy it at $400. So now as the short seller, you're returning your shares because you just, you just bought them. Now you're returning them to the broker and they're going to pay you the difference. So you bought them at 500 for 10 shares. It's 50 a piece. It went down $10. So now you're at four hundred dollars. You you keep that hundred dollars. Uh, here's the thing on a short sale. Uh, wow, that's not much money. Okay, put a few more zeros. You bought a thousand shares. All right, now you've got a uh, thousand dollars or ten thousand dollars, and this may have happened in in one trading day. In fact, it may have happened in a couple of hours. And so, in a couple of hours, you just made ten grand. Nice. Lots of risk. Lots of reward. Tesla. I'm sure we're all familiar with Tesla, uh, Elon Musk company, lots of things they do. We're looking at the car company itself. Tesla has been one of the most shorted stocks uh, in the past five, six, seven years. Okay, so here we are. We are a short seller. We think Tesla, you know, uh, all the tax breaks are, are, are leaving for the energy credits. And so I think it's way overvalued. So you borrow 100 shares from Tesla, from brokerage firm. Now they're 400 a share. So you're a short seller. Now you sell those 100 shares, okay, at 400. You immediately sell it because you believe that price is going down. So there's your 40,000. Tesla loses stock. It buys back at 200. Now this happened a couple of years ago. It was at 400 by December. It was down to 200, lost 50% of its value. Now you return it. You said, you know what? I'm happy with that. It might go lower, but I'm happy with the 200. I'm going to now buy those shares back. And again, it is it is more of an accounting transaction here. You're really not taking ownership of the shares itself. Uh, as much as you're just you're you're going to gain on the net here. So you you take those back. You you return them back to the brokerage firm, and the firm basically has to make you a twenty thousand dollar check because that's what you got. Interesting. What happens if the stock does not go down and it goes up? This is the inherent risk. Theoretically, you would have unlimited risk because the stock could just keep going up and up and up. Practicality, it wouldn't, but theoretically, it is an unlimited risk. So you have to know that going in. You're selling Tesla short again. You borrow the thousand shares at 400. All right, and you sell those shares in the market. Now, this is a loan, it's a margin call loan. So basically, the interest rate, whatever that brokerage firm uh, charges, you're going to pay them money. They're always going to make some money off this transaction. That's just something we always have to understand in the business world. How can we survive and thrive and do well? Okay, but you're good. You think it's going down. Oh my goodness, it went up $300 in 60 days. Well, what's happening? Uh, let's just say you want out. Okay. You now need to purchase 1,000 shares at $700. That's 700,000. Okay, this was 400,000. You now have to give back that stock to the brokerage firm and you have to pay them $300,000. Also, as we'll look, during this time, you can't just keep holding on to it and not, you could, but you're going to have to pay up for that. You're going to, have to pay a lot more interest rates. So, again, the risk in here, the margin call, you hold on to Tesla, you think it's going to go back down. Well, now interest is charged on that loan per month. And you also have to have uh, more s skin in the game. 
So it could be a 20% interest, you're paying $7,000 a month. Also, the minimum investment goes down, you owe the difference. So we're owing $300,000. You've got to come up with that money, and you'll see that in the movie The Big Short, uh, when it didn't work the way they wanted to at first. Uh, so now we're, 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 we're putting in more money. The minimum now, you had, you had uh, maybe $200,000 in for the loan. The minimum is now three fifty. dollars uh, it, it just, there's a lots of things that are happening here that you have to add up. So I have to add an additional one hundred and fifty dollars to keep current with the margin plus interest. That's what happens. And if you can't, well, man, I can't do that. I don't have the money. That's what's called a margin call. Whatever you have, you have to pay immediately back to the brokerage firm. Well, I don't have. Well, you've got you've got a home, you've got a car, you, you you've got. They can take personal assets at that. That is why, my friends, this is the most. This is one of the highest riskiest investments that you, that you have in the legal world, so to speak. And maybe remember GameStop. If we could back up a couple of seconds, if we remember, Toys R Us. Oh my gosh, man! My daughter loved Toys R Us. I mean, Toys R Us was 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 um, founded back in the '40s, and uh, it became so big in the '80s. And it was this great toy store, and it was a category killer because no one could compete with it. And I uh, mean, you can go in there just have fun all day long. Well, uh, in the early aughts, uh, Toys R Us wanted to do a few different things. They wanted to take the company private. They wanted to sell the company to the boards of directors. They were kind of old. And so as time went on through 2005, 2010, 2015, um, other investors saw that Amazon's coming on so strong. Toys R Us may be a victim of disruptive technology. Not many people want to do just brick and mortar all day long. And, and if you remember Toys R Us, they were, they were very large stores. They were huge. And so they were starting to bet it very short. Melvin Capital was one of those organizations, and it bankrupted the company to where it was nothing. Um, they couldn't sell it, and they were selling short, and the company just basically dissolved. I think they're trying to come back now, but our history was gone. And so GameStop had the same storm hitting it. Or do we really go in to buy all of our games at GameStop or we just go to do it all online and have them downloaded? So in 2021, stock was trading at $25 a share. Melvin Capital, they're a hedge fund. They're, they're, they were great at shorting out lots of companies. They had no care. They had, they, they had no emotion of, well, you know, these are some of these stores, you know, built the United States of America. You know, Sears, Blockbuster, Kodak, stores companies that don't exist anymore. So they put in an $85 million position to sell it short. They're thinking they're going to make some quick money, they're going to, they're going to kill GameStop, and they're going to be on to their next victim. So, again, break, bankrupt brick and mortar. Other investors jumped in. It's a great documentary on Netflix uh, that just released, and I think you like it. Here's Roaring Kitty. So, Roaring Kitty's Keith Gill, he loved Toys R Us. He saw what was going on. And a social media guy, you know, he was an investment advisor on Reddit. And so he pulled in and said, we can't let corporate America do what they did to GameStop, what they did to Toys R Us and to other companies in the past. So what happened is a short squeeze. If everyone is betting short, which they did on GameStop, then people, then the stock is going to start rising because everyone's you're 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 buying the stock itself. To you know, shares of stock are going in, and you're betting them short. Well, it could still make the stock rise, which is exactly what happened. So Keith Gill saw this happening earlier, and he purchased a bunch of shares, and he got on, um, of course, so many followers on his uh, Reddit page, and they were going viral. He said, look, bite on Robin Hood. Okay, this is easy. This is how we're going to fight corporate America. February of March 2021, that's GME, GameStop, it went to $500 a share. During March of 2021, every single share of GameStop was in play. In fact, if you went on Robinhood and tried to buy it, you couldn't. There was no stock to buy. You cannot sell short on Robinhood. You have to have a, an advanced brokerage firm to do this because, again, there's a lot of margin loaning right in here. So they're betting, Rory kidding, 
their betting debt is going to go up. So they're buying the stock. So the stock is in play. And again, it's just supply demand. Everybody wants the stock thinking wherever way it's going to go, $500 a share. There it is, GameStop. Hey, where's it located? Grapevine, Texas. All right. There's 625 West Parkway, Westport Parkway. You've you probably passed it. Didn't even know if you're going on to the airport, if you're going up 114 East. March 2021, every share was in stock. That's what a piece of stock looks like. You get this nice certificate. It could say one share of stock. It could say 10,000 shares of stock. It is just like a denomination. Well, bye, 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 Melvin Capital. Um, since the spread was so big, in order for Melvin Capital to cover the short losses, because they're losing money right now, crazy amount, they had to secure $7 billion in total losses to cover their bet of making GameStop short. They couldn't. They shut down the company in 2022. It's David and Goliath, and David beat Goliath again in this one. Wow, they were trying to get uh, Keith Gill into, uh, he's doing all sorts of things illegal. Finally, the SEC basically said, look, this is the inherent risk. You bet short, you lost. Um, all these small little investors did very, very well, and that's it. You know, there's nothing. Now, he unplugged his Reddit account, and he hadn't been heard of. If I were him, I'd have done the same thing. I think you would have, too. Shut everything out, took his money, and uh, probably bought an island next to Nicole Kidman's island in the Bahamas, or whatever that might be. Maybe there's a stock option. There's Again, we're just hitting the highlights of stocks, my friends, and investment. Um, you can do a stock option, okay? It's another instrument, like I said. You can have Wall Street make up. Uh, and create or engineer all sorts of different financial transactions. And that can get us into a lot of trouble, but that's just the way of the nature of the beast. So this is an instrument that gives you the right, but not the obligation, to purchase a given asset at an agreed upon price and date, Investopedia. A uh, great place to learn a lot of uh, investment and knowledge. So, you are charged a premium, okay, again, someone's going to make their money, by the seller for such that right, and then a security at a chosen price at some point in the future. A couple of options right here. All right, these are usually long calls. You can do short calls on them as well. So, long calls, buy and hold. You have $5,000. You wanted to purchase some Apple stock. Okay, so $5,000... At 165 bucks a share, you get to buy 30 shares, and you're just right about $5,000. Okay, great. Apple rises $182 in 30 days. Now your 30 shares are worth $5,460. If you want to sell right now, you just got a nice 10% return on your investment. You had $5 and 10, uh, so you $510. Hey, great. Well, if you said, man, I kind of want some more money than that, uh, and, and I'm willing to upgrade my risk. So, same scenario, you buy stock options and you sh with a strike price of 165 which means that's the price that I buy it at. And it's a 30-day option. The premium for each share is $5.50, or 550 per 100-share contract. Now, again, you're not actually buying the stock. You're buying an option. It's a transaction. So instead of $5,000 going into 30 shares of stock, you buy nine contracts at $550 for $4,950. So now you have the option to control a whole lot more Apple shares. Apple does exactly what you thought it would do. It rises $182 in 30 days. You're not buying Apple stock because you love it and you love iPhones. I mean, you might, but you're buying it to see, I want to see if I can get some quick money in, in, in 30 days. So now, at the end of 30 days, okay, your contract is expiring. If it expires with more money than you thought it would go, the stock went to 182 and you struck it at 165, <clears throat> Your options die in the money, which is great, uh, which means you exercise that option at $17, gaining $17 a share. So now you have a $9,990 or 200% return on investment within those 30 days. You never really took possession 
of the stock itself, but you bought an option to exercise. So it just becomes a quick transaction at the end. What if the money didn't do anything? What if it just stayed at 165? Well, you just spent $4,950 to do that. If it went down, the same thing. You only would lose your investment for the for the option. You wouldn't lose more than that. You don't have to do the uh, what happened in the in the short selling. So that's a different option right there. Those are called stock options, long calls. We could put long puts. A put is the opposite direction. Again, you think the stock's going to decrease from sixty to fifty. You purchase an option. For the five dollar premium right there so you get for five hundred dollars for a hundred share contract if it goes up then you just lost your contract so again if you were hitting out at five hundred dollars that's all you lost even though the stock price went up and you're supposed to cover those losses on a short sale you just bought an option you never actually bought the stock itself so those are some interesting ways. <clears throat> Again, sophisticated, definitely have to go through a full brokerage firm. Uh, Robinhood would not let you do that. It's just for buying and holding. Still something great there. <clears throat> now, what if the company that you work for, if they give you stock options? That's usually an executive's pay right there. Um, again, it's a for-profit company, so it's got to be that, not a non-profit. Gives you the option. They let you buy it at a discounted value. Again, you're not selling it short. <clears throat> nobody company want nobody company wants to do that. They don't want to lose their value because they're losing uh, market capitalization. They want it to rise, and you do too. So um, UPS, uh, I don't know Federal Express, but a lot of big companies give you stock options and, and, and profit sharing and pension. If you can take advantage of it, my friends, again, that's the first thing that we talk about in investment. What can we do that's very easy? And you might, you're more than likely would not pay a whole lot of brokerage fees for this either. So you build motivation. Again, if you have a thousand shares of stock inside your company as a stock uh, for options, and it's doing well, I mean, that's motivated. That kind of wants to, I want to get up and go to work and, and, and produce real hard so this uh, can go great. Usually, you have a vesting period of a year. That means you work there for a year. It's heavily used in startup organizations. So uh, we don't have a lot of money, but we know this company's going to do well, and that's why it created uh, a lot of tech startups will create so many multimillionaires, uh, on paper at least, uh, because they have so many shares of stock and now the stock is rising. They took a public and it did well. So if you can ever get into a startup before it's gone public, get the stock and it goes pu public uh, and you get a really good uh, gain, you might just want to sell that same day and take the money and then uh, go on to your next deal. Could be really good for you. Again, a quick recap on our stocks, my friends. It is the heart of the United States economy. Stocks are equity that build corporations. You become an owner. It's how they finance themselves. And of course, you know, you can gain a, a lot more reward in the stock market. There is higher risk. You have to you have to know the unknown. So that's a lot of diligence in your research to succeed. Um, if you want to start out small and just figure this out and have some fun, get that Robinhood app. I, I, I don't sell it, I don't make any money off that, so I just wanna let you know, but I think it could be a, it's a great way, again, kinda of like the Davids and Goliaths out there, to start demystifying a very overwhelming subject of who do I have to talk to, what do I have to do to, to start buying stock, and I can do it on my phone, and I can do roundups. Very, very interesting. I hope that helps, and I hope you enjoyed learning just a little bit more of how stocks can operate and be a part of your investing financial plans.